Hi there again. So this is the second video I'm going to be doing on Ronald Reagan, on um, the development of Ronald Reagan as a political figure uh, and his journey to power throughout the 1960s and 70s. So even before we look at um, Ronald Reagan and his origins, his background, his um, upbringing, his acting work and his war years, Let's talk a little bit about where his ideas uh, emerge from. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, from the New Deal onwards, um, under Franklin Roosevelt, um, and particularly during the Second World War, the role of the state and its... Um, its role really in correcting the failings of free markets and during the Second World War in uh, saving the democratic world um, had become by the, this was like the, the, the 40s and 50s largely unchallenged. Um, one of the things that's worth mentioning about uh, the wartime years is that if you think that the New Deal was a, a significant um, development in state spending um, and the significant development in state control. It is as nothing compared to um, Roosevelt's command of the American economy during the Second World War, where um, state spending then dwarfs the New Deal and the power that the government had over uh, American industry was was um, uh, unprecedented because you existed in a time, you know, we're talking about a time of national crisis, a time when if the government didn't direct the entirety of American industry to build B-17 bombers and Liberty ships, uh, then not only would um, America's allies have gone uh, unequipped, but also America would not have been able to face the kind of the key challenges and battles uh, against Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. So the, the rapid expansion of wartime um, production and the control of the economy during wartime um, and the ability of the state to intervene in particular ways after the war, take for example the, the GI Bill, uh, and the uh, amount of aid given to returning mainly white GIs uh, at, at, at the end of the war uh, was um, would have been kind of inconceivable, say, if you go back before the Second World War and before the Great Depression to the, uh, the Hoover administration of uh, 1929. So these huge epochal, epochal changes, the, the Great Depression and the Second World War, meant that the state had to take on a role that historically it had never uh, inhabited and, and uh, a size and a shape and a power that it had never inhabited. Um, democratic societies around the world, if you look at the examples of America and its nearest uh, equivalent, Great Britain, um, had to hand presidents and prime ministers emergency powers during the war. But the point about democratic societies is those emergency powers were eventually given back. And in the case of Roosevelt, um, it, it, uh, well, Roosevelt doesn't um, survive the war, but eventually emergency powers are, are handed back by the Truman administration. Um, during the 1940s and 1950s, the demands of the Cold War mean that this uh, large state doesn't get any smaller particularly, and that huge um, state subsidies to aircraft manufacturers to prevent them going bust at the end of the war uh, have to continue. Now, as I said, these things were seen as basically common sense and the idea that the, the state can intervene to correct the failings of markets and can intervene to defend the nation and can do all sorts of things uh, was a broadly accepted consensus during the 1940s. However, um, a group of thinkers um, who existed on the fringes of really acceptable social and economic thought uh, in America, uh, centering around the, uh, the writer Ayn Rand, uh, about whom we'll talk about further in, in the coming days, um, and to a greater extent in, in, in Europe and Great Britain, 
um, uh, centering around the uh, thinker Friedrich von Hayek, um, the economist Friedrich von Hayek, uh, argued that uh, the role of the state was inherently, as the state got larger, it became inherently less democratic and inherently more tyrannical, even notionally democratic states, and that government would strangle the uh, entrepreneurial talents of ordinary people, uh, and it was really uh, entrepreneurs who created the wealth in society and entrepreneurs who pushed society forward. And so um, Ronald Reagan uh, found himself... Uh, an advocate of these ideas during the 1950s and 60s. And it left him and others like him um, on the fringes of the Republican Party. These were not mainstream ideas. Um, the idea that massive tax cuts, massive cuts in state spending, and the privatisation or the return to the public sector of huge swathes of um, uh, public capital... Um, Everything from, from roads and highways to schools and hospitals to uh, things that uh, services that the state had provided that could be provided by private industry. These were not mainstream ideas. Uh, during the, uh, the 50s and 60s, it, the Republicans and um, Democrats, for the most part, uh, agreed that the state had a significant role to play in public life. Part of this was to do with the ongoing crisis of the Cold War, but part of it was to do with the fact that there were long, long memories of the Great Depression and that um, people being left to fend for themselves was politically unacceptable. So up until the mid-1960s, uh, Ronald Reagan's politics was not mainstream. It was not shared by most people. Uh, and what tends to happen in these situations is you have to fight political leaders have to wait for moments, particularly moments of crisis, for their ideas to gain uh, broader acceptance and more widespread um, understanding. And Ronald Reagan's moment would come in the mid-1970s, when the, econ uh, the economic success of America was beginning to slow down, and also um, a new spirit of individualism and a new spirit of um, individual self-interest, and uh, less of a, what you would call a collectivist point of view, was starting to proliferate across American society. Um, but again, that's a story for uh, podcast uh, these videos um, in, in the next few days. So to recap, the key points are that by the, by the early 1960s, um, there was still a powerful sense that the state did have a big role to play in uh, keeping society safe and making sure that people had jobs and in making sure society was defended and in doing um, a whole range of different tasks and that the state should have power um, and should have a significant amount of ability to, to tax and spend. And this was the product of the Great Depression, and this was the product of the Second World War. Um, and people by the 1960s still had fresh memories of those two crises. And by the 1970s, these ideas were starting to fade away. And new ideas about limiting the power of the state, limiting the size of the state, and limiting the amount that the state could tax were becoming much more popular. Okay, thanks, and I'll catch you in the next video.